Hi everyone, this is a Barclay Damon Live broadcast where we discuss all things L&E, labor and employment. I'm Ari, let's dig in. Hey guys, welcome to Flipping the Script, what to know about physician contracts with Dr. Andrew Tisser. I am thrilled to announce for our 20th episode, we have our first external guest, which is, as I just mentioned, Dr. Andrew Tisser. Andrew is the Associate Chair of Emergency Medicine at Sisters Hospital, and he is also a career strategist for early career physicians. So Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ari. So happy to be here. Glad you're here. And I did want to let our listeners know just a little interesting tidbit about Andrew is that he and I are neighbors. He lives just a couple doors down from me, so he cannot escape me in both his personal and professional life. That is true. <laughs> um, Andrew, before we dig in, do you um, want to tell us a little bit about what you do at Sisters of Charity Hospital here in Buffalo and just a little bit about your career uh, strategy work? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So um, I'm the Associate Chair of Emergency Medicine, so I'm uh, responsible for the Emergency Department at Sisters of Charity, um, a medical director there. Uh, I have uh, six physicians that work with me and uh, multiple physician assistants, um, and really everything that goes into um, that part of my job. Um, and uh, for the career strategist work, I work with early career physicians, so less than 10 years out of training, uh, who are dissatisfied with their current careers, and uh, we work together to figure out a career that works for them. Um, additionally, I have a podcast called Talk to Me Doc. Yes, uh, I wanted which... to ask you about the podcast. Please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that is a podcast that focuses on the unique unique issues re that relate to the early career physician. Awesome. Well, I think all of your experience, Andrew, um, makes you the perfect guest for today. And I'm really excited for us to um, just get into it. Yeah, me too. Thanks so much. I wanted to let our listeners know that Andrew and I were talking about him coming on and we decided to kind of flip the script and switch it up a little. So Andrew actually asked his... Uh, Twitter audience and his social media audience, you know, what do you want to hear from a labor and employment attorney? So just so our listeners know, that's where the questions are coming from. Um, and Andrew, I am going to turn it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ari. Yeah, I am excited for this opportunity. So um, this is kind of a funny question to ask an attorney, but do you think <laughs> do you think contracts are important especially as they relate to healthcare related and physician related contracts? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, obviously I, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I would definitely say yes, um, especially in this space. I think, you know, being a labor and employment attorney, we see um, employment relationships or we review contracts in all different fields. And I think that healthcare in particular and specifically physician agreements are probably the most common for this space. So I definitely think that, um, you know, if you're an early career physician or if you're for a physician making a move or joining another group, um, the contract is definitely important because as you know better than me, Andrew, I think the relationships between physician groups and their employees, hospital systems and their employees are a little bit more complex than just your average employee. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so we don't want to just like scribble something down on a, ni on a napkin and uh, shake our hands on this or what? Um, I am not supposed to give legal advice on this podcast, but in that <laughs> hypothetical, I would say absolutely um, do not do that <laughs> to anyone who's listening. <laughs> well, I will make a note of that. Yes. So um, yes to contracts. So, well, let's talk about contracts. And so what, what should we be looking for when it comes to a contract? And, you know, I think people are listening in either that are, are just coming out of their training and they're having their first contract and then there'll be some people that maybe are looking towards their second or third job but i think it applies to everyone so what what are some of the important things that you want to know about when it comes to contracts yeah that's a really good question i'm assuming this may be this question may have come from one of the twitter audience members yeah pe people were pretty uh, fired up about this stuff <laughs> I mean, so I keep, uh, saying, I keep saying twitter audience i should just say followers <laughs> like uh, yeah. Clearly, everyone who's listening can tell that I don't have a Twitter. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so that I think that's a great question. I think you're 100% right. And, you know, there are definitely certain things that both physicians and, in, you know, physician groups or hospitals, who the drafter of the contract, the employer, and the physician should both look for. Um, you know, I think I'll just hit a few of them, Andrew, and then maybe we can talk in depth about a couple more. And um, this is like the 
the student becoming the master kind of thing. So if I'm rambling on too much, <laughs> I'm usually the one asking the question. So please feel free to interrupt me. Um, you know, just a few things right off the bat. Normally, one of the first things in the contract is the contract term or the period of time that the contract applies to. Um, you know, if you're signing a document that's legally binding and it's, it's an employment agreement, that's one of the things you want to look out for because you're going to want to know for what specific term the agreement covers. Um, you know, just generally, there's usually something in the physician agreement that delineates the responsibilities or the duties of the physician and then the responsibilities and the duties of the physician's group. Um, with respect to duties of the physicians, one of the things that we look out for, and it, it sounds kind of silly, but um, is the practice locations. So obviously if you're a young physician or maybe you know, you're lateraling over, you're going to a big system or a big group, you, know, you may not want to drive the 45 minutes or an hour and a half to a different practice location. So if that's something that's important to you, I would say definitely make sure that that's in the agreement because sometimes, you know, I've seen um, physician agreements that have like a, a blanket provision in there that say practice all of our practices or, you know, don't specify locations. So I don't know if it, if it were me, I wouldn't if if I'm joining a group that has a Rochester location, our listeners know I'm in Buffalo and obviously you're in Buffalo, too. You know, I wouldn't want to be contractually obligated to drive to Rochester you know, two or three times a month, unless if I were okay with that, that's different. But that's definitely something I've seen kind of um, in there that maybe hasn't, that isn't paid attention to as much. Yeah, I think especially in my field, emergency medicine, a lot of these big systems have multiple locations. And uh, yeah, a lot of them will say like, <clears throat> you know, maybe you get a little extra money if you're, if you're willing to move around. But uh, if you can really lock down where you're going to be, I think that's important because yeah, some of these, some of these are really hour and a half, two hours away from each other and you don't want to be stuck there hundred percent of the time. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, and obviously there's a, there's plenty of things that can be listed with respect to the duties of physicians and physician groups for, you know, for, for responsibilities of the practice, you know, something that I always look for in a contract are call hours. I feel like that's like a, something that, you know, both the physician and the practice is usually interested in making sure that those responsibilities are clear, um, you know, because there are certain um, provisions I've seen that divide it equally among members of the practice. I've seen provisions that basically say once a, a partner or a physician reaches a certain age, you know, they're kind of phased out of their call responsibilities. So just something to keep in mind. And I think because that's that's something that's really important um, to both the group and doctors. Yeah, I think um, I've seen before some some of them listed as just equitable. Yes. And I think that can be kind of nebulous as to what equitable really means. I agree. 100%. Um, so I would <laughs> I think that's something to watch out for, too. Yeah, definitely. I'm glad you agree <laughs> as the boots I on agree. the ground. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, just really briefly, vacation benefits, you know, those are things you're you're probably going to want to review in detail. Um, any type of maternity, paternity leave, fa fam family leave, you know, obviously a lot of our listeners know that those are statutorily granted the types of leave that are available. But, you know, if you're a young career physician and you're thinking about having a family in the next few years, like you definitely want to take a look at whatever the contract may or may not say about that. Um, you know, one other thing I always look for is malpractice insurance. I think obviously if you're a physician and you're joining a group or if you're a a group or a practice and you're having a physician come on, obviously malpractice insurance is something that is important and is usually always included in every contract. Um, you know, you may or may not know this about me, Andrew, but when I first started practicing law way back when I did do some med mal defense. So I'm always hyper <laughs> medical malpractice defense work. So I'm always, you know, hyper um, vigilant when it comes to looking at insurance. Um, you know, sometimes a contract will have a cap on an insurance or the amount of malpractice insurance that's available. I've seen some where um, the contract will say that if the physician has privileges at a hospital, that the physician should make sure that, you know, they have insurance that uh, covers them above and beyond the cap in the policy with the, with the practice. So just there are some little, there are some wonky things with insurance. So I would definitely say, of course, if you're a physician, you've worked super, super hard. You've gone to school for a really long time. In the unlikely, unfortunate event, something happens, or maybe it doesn't, and you're just named in a lawsuit, and, and you know not, you know this happens. Doing med mal defense, I saw this a lot. You just want to make sure you're covered. That's really all, all my spiel <laughs> boils down to. <laughs> 
Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah, and then just I think we can talk about in a little more detail um, termination issues, you know, what the contract says about whether you can be terminated and when and why. Um, and then, of course, a topic which I think is probably the most important, which is um, what we in the legal business call restrictive covenants, which basically are non-competition clauses. And I know just from having friends, family who are um, in the medical field that that's something that comes up a lot. Yes, that's <laughs> uh, that's the money maker right there. Yes. That's what that's that's what the people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well. That's what we're here for, right? So, <laughs> yes, right. So, like, let's dig into that a bit more. So, as far as termination, I know we like when I look at contracts, I see for cause, without cause, you know. And I know people are always worried, like, well, can they just fire me for no reason? You know, especially nowadays with with the pandemic, the last few years right. and staffing cuts and stuff. So, like, what does all that? What does that mean? And how do we navigate that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm really glad that you said, let's dig in, Andrew, because that's kind of what I say. That's like my catchphrase. And I say in the beginning of every episode. But we didn't I plan didn't that. tell you as plan. the host that you had to say it. So I'm glad you said it. I did not pass my hostly duties on properly. But um, no, I'm kidding. So I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, a lot of it, physician agreements or employment agreements generally have these you know, termination without cause, termination with cause provisions. And, you know, it, it really depends on what the contract says, Andrew. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've seen contracts that have a, a termination without cause provision that say, you know, um, there's usually a notice provision. So like w within 100 days notice, this, um, this contract can be terminated without cause by either side. So either the physician can terminate the agreement or the practice or the employer can terminate the agreement with without cause, meaning no particular reason, um, kind of like consistent with an at-will employment type of relationship. But there is usually, you know, a notice requirement with that. So normally that's, you know, there's a, what, a specific number of days you have to give notice. So if you have, it's usually called like a termination without clause in your, in your contract, um, definitely something you want to, look for and be aware of what it says because if you want to you know end your relation your employment relationship with the practice or the practice is you know planning on ending their employment relationship with you there has to be compliance with that notice provision so i think that's that's important to point out because i don't know for me when i you know and even in my personal life if i get a contract and it's 30 pages long it's kind of like when you get to page 28 you're kind of just like all right let me keep re you know <laughs> Let me keep reading. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I think that that's something that's important that your listeners probably would want to know about. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, it's one of those things, you know, you, you, you never take a job thinking about when you're going to leave the job, but it's, uh, you know, at, most people don't stay at their first job. So it's just something uh, that you always got to know about how, how this is going to end, whether it's, um, you know, mutually benefit no longer mutually beneficial or if something's going on i think you got to know about how the contract's going to end right i agree all right so how about uh for cause so is that is that because like a doctor did something wrong or what, how does that work out yeah it can be andrew and another that, that's another good question this is a very lawyerly answer um so i apologize <laughs> in advance but the answer is it depends um so yeah andrew i've seen you know, different types of examples of what would qualify as termination for cause. Um, you know, the easiest one that comes to mind is, you know, the, unfortunately, like the death of the physician. Um, if the physician has to go out on an extended leave for an unknown period of time. Um, you know, if the physician's license, heaven forbid, is revoked, um, canceled, or suspended things like that. So I think that probably gives you a good flavor of the reasons that I've seen that are listed for cause. Um, but you know, one thing I would just say, if you're either the employer or the physician group or the physician, is I would definitely take a very careful look at that because there are, um, sometimes there are clauses in there that say um, at the option of the employer or at the option of the um, group, which is good. Sometimes it will say, you know, automatically terminates the employment relationship. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes there will be opportunities to cure what we call in the legal world cure or fix the alleged grounds for termination. So I think it's really important to to take a look at that because it will give you specific reasons. And I think that's important because if there's a reason that's not there, um, you know, that maybe that your employer is saying is a reason that should be grounds for termination, you could have an argument that it's not because it's not specifically in the contract. So. Got it. Well, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here breaking this down for us because it certainly can get a little complex. Yes, it definitely um, can. And, you know, we us lawyers just love to wordsmith. <laughs> well, that's that that is your profession uh, so like let's get into the thing that i want to talk the most about and and i think my listeners and 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 uh my social media following wants to hear about are those non-compete clauses because there's a lot of information thrown around you know on the one side like you should never accept a non-compete clause um and on the other side of things like oh don't worry about it because they're not enforceable so Let's can we talk about those because I think there's so much confusion uh, as it relates to the restrictive covenants. Yes, uh, absolutely, and I'm 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 not surprised that your listeners want to hear about this because I think this is kind of a, a an amorphous area in the law. And just so you know, Andrew, obviously we see this with physician agreements, but this kind of permeates many different fields and professions. So the answer to the question of whether you should never sign a restrictive covenant, what we call a restrictive covenant or a non-compete clause. Um, I don't like to ever speak in absolutes as a lawyer, <laughs> but I don't think that that's true. I think that there can be non-compete clauses that are beneficial to both sides. And, you know, at the end of the day, but, and we'll talk about this in a minute, non-compete clauses can certainly be enforceable. So, for people who are listening, um, you know, whether you're on the employer side and you're just stick whatever in the contract because, you know, that's what somebody told you to do or you're a, a young career physician, you know, I think you definitely have to read it and you have to take it seriously because it, it could be enforceable. So I think what, what you said, Andrew, the, the two sides of the token, neither of them are right. <laughs> and Fair as enough. most things, we'll probably just find some sort of compromise answer in the middle. <laughs> But, you know, I, I would like to talk a little bit about just what the, it, the enforceability piece of it, if you'll allow me, yeah. because I think yeah, this, is, this is probably what's, you know, most interesting um, to your listeners. So in New York, um, the general rule is if a non-compete clause is reasonable under the law, it's enforceable. And obviously, being a physician, that's a very highly specialized field, so there are some extra considerations when you're looking at a physician agreement as opposed to, you know, a, a different type of uh, employment agreement. So in New York, you know, there's no particular statute or law that governs this area. It's really all what the courts have said. So that kind of tends to lead to why it's a little bit amorphous. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll dig in. But I just want to briefly tell you the test. It's, you know, basically a, a non-compete in a physician's agreement has to be reasonable in time, geography, and scope. So we'll talk about what reasonable means. Um, that is a world, that's a word for us legal beagles that's thrown around a lot. Um, it has to be necessary to protect the employer's interests, not harmful to the public, and not unduly burdensome. So that's the, te the legal test for the enforceability of a non-compete clause. <laughs> Oh, just those things. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so again, a little bit of amorphous. I think people are probably wondering, what, well, what, what, the he Ari, what the heck does that mean? Cool. I am wondering that. Reasonable in time and scope. Great. So <clears throat> just as an overarching background piece of information, as I just mentioned a couple minutes ago, you know, physician agreements, physician, the physician field is highly specialized. So this is... I think an area where enforceability is a little bit more likely than other areas, provided what we're about to talk about is satisfied. So I just want to kind of put that out there. So the whole notion of I don't, I'm just going to sign this, this agreement even though it has a non-compete clause because it's not going to be enforceable. I think let's set the record straight on that. I think that's a very cavalier attitude to have. And if you're hearing Andrew, anyone say that, definitely provide yeah. some, <laughs> step in and provide some That is some a scary guidance. mindset, it seems. Yes, exactly. So um, let's talk about time. What's reasonable in time? So 
you know, again, it depends. Not an answer people want to hear a ton, but if you have a non-competition agreement that has five years in it, that's probably not reasonable in time. If you have a year period of time, that's probably going to be held to be reasonable. If you have six months as a piece, the period of time identified in your non-competition agreement, it's it's likely going to be enforceable. So, you know, I think five years from what we've seen and what the courts in New York have said is too long. If you're in the year-ish range, like, it's probably reasonable. Fair enough. I mean, you know, and then anything beyond that becomes uh, somewhere in that middle ground, right? Like, yeah. who knows? Yeah, I think if you're if you're in the realm of a couple of years, you're pro you're in that middle ground. If you're talking more than five years, it's probably not reasonable. It's probably too long. So hopefully sure. that gives a bit of a range as to what would be reasonable. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a lot of them that are like somewhere. They're usually like one or two years. I don't think people try to be like, no, oh, you can't work here for ten years. Yeah, Go find somewhere you'd be else surprised to because I have seen some with like five, which I think is is way too long. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Um, so geography, and this one is a little bit different um, because if you're talking like 15 to 20 mile radius of like where you were working before, that's probably okay. If you're talking 100 miles, it's probably not okay. But with the caveat, well, let me back up. If your non-compete says, if the non-compete says has no geographic limitation, probably not okay because it's probably what we in the legal field call ambiguous or not specific enough. And not having any geographic limitation is way too broad. That's how the courts have interpreted it, which I think makes sense. But if you're talking 100 miles, probably way too too far of a reach from a geographical perspective. With the caveat, though, though, if you are in a remote area and you know um, the, a large geographic area, it could be okay. So if you're in a, an area where there's not many physician groups or you're in a hyper super specialized area and there aren't many practices in your area that practice that particular specialty, um, you're getting a little bit more in the gray area when there are non-competes that cover like a whole city, for example. Um, yeah. And that comes into, t I mean, I think here in Buffalo, you know, if you got a 30 mile non-compete, that's the entire city. Correct. Right? I mean, correct. There's nowhere else you could work. <laughs> it's very true. It's it. That's true. So, you know, whether or not that's reasonable really depends on what specialty you're practicing and also the time limitation, because there are instances in New York where courts have said that non-competes that have a broad geographic reach are OK because the duration was so short. So it, it's kind of a balancing test. I know that's not a bright line answer, but if you have a very large geographic limitation, but a super, super short period of time, like six months, for example, it, it could be okay, just depending on what the space, what the geographic region looks like and what the competition is in that area. Got it. So I know that's kind of a little bit weird. Um, oh, that's helpful though. You know, with respect to courts considering the employer's interests. You know, if you're in a situation where a, a practice or a group or a system brought you to the community at like a large expense to the practice or to the system, recruited you, moved you here, paid you a sign-on bonus, paid all your moving expenses, you know, put you up in a hotel while your house was being finished. I don't know, whatever crazy stuff you doctors <laughs> get to do. <laughs> um, you know, that's gonna, that probably would weigh in favor of the employer because the employer puts so much time and energy into bringing you into the community, the system, et cetera. So basically if a number of positions are leaving a group and, you know, and a, a practice is trying to enforce a non-compete, if do, if enforcement of the non-compete would lead to a shortage of physicians in that particular area, then it's less likely to be enforced. So hopefully Andrew, that helps kind of explain what the non-competition agreement um, is in, in what, pieces and what may be enforceable yeah it does and it, and it really it, it really sheds a light on how complex this is right um and and why you really need to dig into your individual agreement because you know a endocrinologist in a rural area that's you know there are no other ones versus you know a, a, a generalist in new york city are going to have uh very different enforceability provisions as it comes to these non-competes so it really is very specific to the agreement and the and the physician at hand it seems exactly you're 100 percent right 
So last thing about um, these non-competes, what if, going back to what we talked about before, what if you're terminated without cause and you have one of these um, non-compete clauses, then what happens? Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, the answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> your listeners are just going to be like, everything depends. And you know what? That's a great <laughs> takeaway because that's 100% accurate as it relates to um, the law. But in all seriousness, this is, you know, this is a good question because some courts have said, okay, well, you were terminated without cause, um, so your, your non-competition agreement shouldn't be enforceable. Um, and it really comes down to why were you terminated, you know, as a physician or as an employer, why did you terminate the physician? Was it actually without cause or was it for cause? Because if it was for cause, um, you know, it's more likely that a court would, in fairness, enforce the non-competition agreement. So, again, it's just really, really important to take a look at what is in your specific contract and what it says on that issue. Because some contracts are silent on that issue or don't say anything about it. And that's kind of when it really becomes an issue if you have to get, unfortunately, get into litigation about whether it's enforceable. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I think, you know, it's, uh, it is definitely very complicated. Um, but for some reason, there, as a whole, physicians have this general distrust of attorneys, even when they're on our side, for whatever reason. Um, like, even the ones that are supporting us, I, I don't understand where it comes from. You're like, you know, you're buying a house and you're a real estate attorney. I don't know. I want to talk to the lawyer. But this begs the question, you know, and a lot of doctors, for some reason, want to DIY and bootstrap things. But when it comes to contracts... Should they be getting a lawyer? I mean, I think um, I think I know your answer, and you may be slightly yes. biased, but um, <laughs> yes, one hundred percent, yes. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, you know, it's it's kind of like the same thing. It's like for me, like you know, if I'm sick, I go to the doctor. If my car needs work, I go to a mechanic. You know, if you're a doctor and you got to look at a contract, just get a lawyer. It's the same thing. <laughs> like you just, you, it's it's complicated, and there are so many nuances as as we've talked about, and so many facts specific answers to certain questions. So I would just definitely say yes. Um, you know, you don't want to be in a spot where you're, you're unfortunately, you want to leave a group or a practice wants to, you know, terminate your relationship. You don't want to be in a spot where you don't know what your contract says, and then you're kind of in the lurch. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and even just the, these uh, non-competes we talked about, like our practices law in the state of New York. Uh, if you're listening from outside of New York, that could be that could be totally different. Um, and an attorney would know, you know, more state specific provisions as well. And, you know, high, yeah, like, like she said, you know, if you're, if your water pipe breaks, you're going to call a plumber. So get a lawyer, <laughs> get someone to look at it for you. It doesn't have to be scary, but, yeah. uh, I think that's a great takeaway message. Yes. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for interviewing me. I, that was a little like different, but. <laughs> um, I liked it. Hopefully I didn't drone on too much and hopefully this. No, was that was great. Thank you. And hopefully this is, you know, this is very helpful to your listeners and to our listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in. Join in for our next segment. What, where we tell you what to do when the department of labor is knocking at your door. You don't want to miss it. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. The labor employment podcast is available on barclaydamon.com, YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple podcasts, Spotify, and Google podcasts. Like follow, share, and continue to listen. Thanks. This material is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice or a legal opinion, and no attorney-client relationship has been established or implied. Thanks for listening.